Good afternoon, everyone. This is uh, John Lafferty. I'm from Sell My Light. I'm also the past president of, of the chapter Delaware section of ASQ. This actual presentation I presented to 11 ASQ sections in the East Coast. And uh, today I'm presenting it as a webinar on behalf of the ASQ section uh, 1108 Blue Ridge. And uh, this is your lunchtime webinar. I know we started a little late due to technical difficulties, uh, but I will definitely have this done within the hour for you um, if you are on a uh, schedule within this hour. We start today with systems thinking into 2018. Yes, we still need it. Uh, one of the reasons why I came up with this presentation and have presented it to various ASQ sections is the fact that we're very attuned today for uh, DMAIC and um, Black Belt and Green Belt and so forth. And we're a lot on the, as far as on the Six Sigma process, but a lot of times in businesses, I, I call it um, pretty much draining the swamp, basically, that you you look at a certain area you come into, whether, whether you're doing a, a vendor audit or whether you just acquired a new company or new eyes on, on, a, on a new department that maybe you've been transferred to. And you start to look around and things don't really seem like they should be operating the way that they should. And I've spent probably about 30 years in this particular area. And uh, I had the opportunity over my lifetime to both um, speak and uh, chat and have lunch with Dr. Deming. And um, I, I, I've gathered a lot of my uh, knowledge as far as in systems thinking and and it's historically it's been with us for a very long time uh, even before the uh, Japanese revolution in the 80s and 90s and and so forth so what my goal today is to maybe to uh, go over some of the basic historical things with systems thinking I'll tell you some of the basics of it uh, bringing in some of the organizational development uh, theories as well as I'm going to, towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to give you two e examples of very live, concrete um, um, improvement areas that, that I use systems thinking with. Now, many of you might be looking at this and you might be saying, well, you know what, we could apply a Pareto chart or maybe do some design of experiments here and so forth. I want you to look at this more or less kind of as common sense, but at the same time, uh, some avenues and some methods that I've used over my 30-year uh, history with using systems thinking. Systems thinking, uh, our fathers of the theory of, the, of it, have really came down to uh, Dr. Deming and uh, Joe Duran, but it actually goes even further than that. If you, if you look at Dr. Deming and you say, okay, Walter Schuhart, at Bell Laboratories and was kind of the father of systems thinking as far as control charting and looking at things as a system and so forth. So it really started out with Dr. Deming and, and Duran kind of be the, the forefathers of system thinking. But we turned to uh, the late Peter Schultes, who um, really to me is probably the person that did the most for systems thinking because he looked at everything from performance appraisal in companies, as well as to uh, procedures on the workforce with the operators, to everything in the managerial level at a company. Uh, he was the one that really promoted systems thinking. We also had on the side Myron Trivis, who is to me probably the father of flow charting and procedures. A lot of times when we think of procedures and we think of SOPs and so forth, uh, first thing comes to mind is something like ISO 9000 and so forth. But really, Myron Tribus um, back in the 80s was really the father of this and, and the father of flow charting. Uh, we then turn to Peter Sange and Peter, um, he has probably done the most in the last 10 to 15 years. Peter, uh, who has written the fifth discipline, really goes into saying that systems thinking is just a way an organization and managers have to be if they really want to survive 
each decade going forward. So he's he's really the most contemporary person that we have as far as on systems thinking theory. Why bother with systems thinking? Well, one of the reasons is, according to Dr. Deming, about 85% of all work problems are a result of the system. And the only people that can change the system is management. Now, closer to Dr. Deming's death, um, and a couple of interviews that he had, he believed it was as high as 96% of all the problems in a company uh, were direct result of management controlling the system, that there was only 4% was the responsibility of pure random chance error or because of the operators. But clearly 96%, he thought it was in the higher 90s that, um, that management has a responsibility for changing uh, the work processes and the problems and so forth. Joe Duran thought it was the 85-15 role in management, simply that 85% of the problems that happen in a company happen at a direct result of manage, the management's responsibility, and only 15% uh, happen because of the operators or the production for people. Peter Schultes estimated that there was 90% of all the organizational problems lie in the system. But the two most important things that comes out of out of any of these um, great uh, historical figures that we have on systems thinking is one is that very few problems are a result of a single cause and effect relationship. And secondly, very few problems can be solved with a single solution. What is a system? Well, the Webster's Dictionary defines a system as a group of interacting bodies under the influence of related forces. Again, I'll repeat that. The Webster's Dictionary repeats, uh, re defines a system as a group of interacting bodies under the influence of related forces. What is a system? Well, Peter Sange, in his book, The Fifth Discipline, this is more or less somebody who's in a managerial course at college or even at the graduate level. If they read Sange's book, they're, they're re he really drives home that a system's defined as a perceived whole whose elements hang together because they continually affect each other over time and operate towards a common purpose. The great Russell Acuff, who uh, was at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania uh, in his, in his all-classic definition of systems, defined a system as a logical configuration, the essential elements harmoniously working or not, to achieve a well-defined set of objectives or to solve a specific problem within a given period of time. All systems, 99% of all systems are open systems. And what I mean by open systems is they start out with uh, some kind of materials or resources which go into inputs. And then there's some type of a transformation process that takes place within the system. And that could be um, the, the production of goods or promoting a service or whatever. And then there's an output. And from an output, there's users or end users or per se customers. But the main thing to, to take from this uh, diagram that I show you is 99% of all systems are open systems and they're affected by the environment that surrounds them. And they're all subject to what's called the law of entropy, which is that all systems will eventually run down. Systems thinking. Well, sy the systems thinking principle is the fact that blaming others don't solve the problem. Sometimes we need to stop and ask ourselves, are we contributing to the problem as managers or supervisors or, or engineers in, 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 the, uh, in the process? This will be an aid in our own emotional development. Now, I love self-development methods, and there's, there's many that are out there. And if you haven't taken any of these as either an engineer or, or a quality manager or whatever, I highly suggest them because they not only tell you about people, they tell you a lot about yourself. The first is such as like a 360 reach method. There's another one by a person by his name's Buckingham uh, is the author. And he has a method called Standout 2.0. Uh, emotional intelligence, uh, which is a highly recommended one. And also strength finders, which 
currently, I would say over the last four years, it's been within the top 10 on the Nielsen ratings on the top 10 business books ever sold. Um, all, all of these methods, whether it's 360 reach, whether it's standout, whether it's emotional intelligence, EI, or strength finders, tells us a ton about not only about ourselves but about others. Everything from, you know, if we're dealing with a system and we do realize that it is operator error or we feel as though there's a management uh, blockage for uh, turf, turf issues or personal problems with another manager, these methods and these self-evaluation techniques really help us kind of dig in and see who we are as far as in this process we might be contributing to the problem with not even knowing. So, so these, these organizational uh, techniques for systems uh, thinking is, is critical. In systems thinking principle, that really comes down to this model where at the bottom there's events, events turns into patterns, patterns turns into a structure, and the structure turns into mental models. Events happen all the time and they continue to happen. Our challenge is to look past the event stage and ask other kinds of questions. So we have all these single events happening. Once these single events happen, we look at these events and say, is there any kind of patterns that are taking place? For most of us from a quality or, or a quality engineering standpoint, this is where we look at, say, for example, a histogram, okay? When we're looking at the individual data, we're saying, are there any patterns that exist here? Then we ask ourselves, what may be causing this pattern to occur? And that brings us to as far as the structure. What does this all look like? And then how is this affecting other areas? And this is the balloon effect. I, I always love the, using this terminology, balloon effect, because in my past experience in business, it always seems that whenever sometimes you think that you're solving a major issue, you might be causing five or seven other different problems in another area. So for example, if I would take the area, say for example, invoicing in a company, I might put processes in place that really, um, really improve our invoicing process, but there might be other things in a balloon effect. For example, maybe we're making customers unsatisfied. Maybe we're losing customers. Uh, our terms are not sufficient enough compared to the competition now. So there's a lot of things that once you push in and solve one problem, you might, might, you might solve that one problem, but create 10 other problems. Characteristics of the system. This comes out of the, um, the standards of training and development area. Uh, basically, they define the characteristics of, of, of systems thinking as to understand complex relationships and interdependencies, to balance the short-term and long-term needs and perspectives, reframe the issue or the problem and from the quality area, this is where things as an affinity tree or a tree diagram and so forth, uh, or affinity diagram or tree diagram would, would, would really, really help uh, to re reframe the issue or the problem. See the entirety of the situation through such things as either flow charting it to see what it looks like, or if you come out of the lean area, such as a spaghetti diagram to see how chaotic it is from the, from the get-go. Discern patterns of reoccurring problems, question any and all underlying assumptions, and develop an understanding and compassion of the situation. Now, one of the basic problems in process management when we look at systems is if we look at a typical organizational chart within a company, which a lot of us start when we go to do an audit of a vendor or so forth, we look at it to kind of see pictorially what, you know, how, how does this company operate or how does this work area look like? Well, one of the basic problems with that is organizations are designed vertically, which means that there's a hierarchy structure usually from top usually from top to bottom sometimes it's from middle to bottom but um, you, you have this organizational structure which is defined vertically for example the CEO uh, the marketing the engineering the manufacturing the finance VPs they all report to CEOs and then you have layers under there and then you have another layer under there so organizations from an organizational chart hierarchy 
they report to one another top to bottom. When you look at systems, though, systems processes flow horizontally. So there's a lot of white spaces in between these various structures that we have on an organizational chart or within a departmental chart. But organizations actually operate horizontally. They don't actually operate vertically as they might be defined. Another organizational uh, approach that we have is called the six box organizational model. This also comes out of organizational development where a system is defined as what business are we in? That's the purpose of the system. The structure is how do we divide up the work? The rewards in the system are do all needs, do all needed tasks have incentives? Then there's helpful mechanisms in the system saying, have we adequate coordinating technologies to make the system run? Then there's relationships in the system. How do we manage conflict? And I can't stress enough during this presentation, if you haven't gone through such things as strength finders, emotional intelligence, stand out, and really see what your side of the street looks like uh, within problems within your organization. You're really missing the boat for both self-development as well as maybe solving the problem in, in a, a shorter amount of time. And then leadership. Does anyone keep the boxes in balance? So this all comes out of what they refer to in organizational development as a six-box uh, organizational model for systems. Managing an organization as a system. Well, we establish a business strategy. We assess the current state of the system. We document the measurement system, which many of you know a lot of times whenever you're looking at a process, the measurement system, if that from the start is out, out of whack, it's pretty much going to throw your whole system. Just getting the measurement system in place sometimes solves half the problem. Uh, identify core processes and develop a performance improvement plan. Develop a performance measurement and management system and then modify the structure if necessary. Well, I'm going to turn to some basically some common sense approaches, which I've used in systems thinking, but it really goes a long way. One of the biggest things that I always say is a problem well-defined is a problem half solved. And in most of the cases, if you don't have a very well-defined problem and a problem definition, um, you could go down the road. And I've, I've been involved with, with various work teams where We've worked for months on a, on a problem, only to find that we never really defined the problem in the first place. A key managerial phrase, and this comes from Peter Schultes, is what are we giving you that you don't need, and what do you need that we're not giving you? Um, I was responsible for uh, some overseas operations. Tell you, trying to manage something from the States to overseas the two biggest questions I always ask the divisional managers over there is what are we giving you that you don't need? Because a lot of times we're giving them stuff that they really don't need as well as we're in the expense of deliveries and everything else. We're actually providing them stuff that they don't really need. And then on the other cases, what do you need that we're not giving you? So if you can answer these two questions a lot of times, you're about 80% ahead of the game. Understanding your process. This comes from Myron Tribus, who is, to me, the father of flow charting. If you don't know how it works now, how are you going to know when it doesn't work? This is why we document the process in using flow charting. Um, this man, to me, probably has done more for the uh, documentation of processes that, that I can even imagine. He's worked for many industries, many of the Fortune 500 industries, and was responsible for a lot of the procedural development and flow charting methods and so forth. Um, Dr. Pat Donnelly, uh, the, the late Pat Donnelly, uh, was a mentor of mine from Drexel University. And he used to always say how to improve the system. There's three main areas that you must always ingrain in your mind if you're going to improve a system. And that is, number one, in God we trust, all others bring data. So, you know, it's, we, we, we got to trust the people. You know, if we ask 
a department manager to bring us the data of late orders from the last six months, he can't bring us the data and say, well, I don't believe this guy. Let me run five other different methods to get the data. So if we ask people to bring us data, just to bring us data, and they don't really know what we're going to do with it, we just got to really trust people to bring us the data and that they're going to bring us the data. The second is don't shoot the messenger. In other words, the person that gave you the data has no idea, might not even be responsible for the department. They might be somebody from information systems from your organization that brought you the data. So don't shoot the messenger. And finally, fix the problem, not the blame. You know, we, we, we can blame people all day, all week, all year long, but it's never going to fix the problem. So fix the problem, not the blame. Statistical control of your system. Uh, this comes out of uh, Deming's, if anybody has ever read, has ever read Out of the Crisis, which is probably one of my favorite books uh, in systems thinking and quality control. But Deming's Out of the Crisis stresses, but Dr. Deming used to always, always really stress this. And that is all systems show either that they are in control or out of control. How we can tell this through a control chart. Does the data fall within a control unit? Yes, it does, or no, it doesn't. The control limits, uh, what Deming used to say, now we, we could go over five different types of control charts. We can talk about uh, P charts, MP charts, X and R charts, uh, individual plus moving range. Uh, we could talk about uh, Q sum. We could talk about various control charts. Deming used to always just say, listen, if you can rough cut this thing and think of the average plus or minus three times the square root of the average, it'll pretty much give you a rough indication whether this process is running consistently or not. His example was like, for example, if there was if the if the average was 36, so 36 plus or minus three times the square root of 36 represents the value of an upper control limit of 54 and a lower control limit of 18. Any value above 54 or below 18, we have, an unass we have an assignable clause. Any value in this range can only be improved through the system change, and that would be through management. Um, to kind of just bear with me, you know, I, I'm pretty much, I'm showing you this just as kind of a rough cut example. And just, you know, you don't have to be really in tune with the math when I'm showing you this, but just, just think of this. If you had a data system with these data points that I have on here, your control limit would be an average of 19.82, a lower control limit of 657, and an upper control limit of 3317. So in this case, with the number set that we have, the number 34 in our number set would be a problem. This would be an assignable cause. So we should look to fix the assignable cause. It could be a human error. It could be a dull tool. It could be the end of a raw material batch. But we should fix this. Any other thing within those control limits can only be can, can changed through the management. And the management really are the only ones that can control that. So, that, I mean, that's really the main point here. There are actually a control chart test that show whether a process is in control or out of control. Uh, I leave a reference here, which can actually, you know, if you want more information, you can go to that reference and check it. Understanding your systems. Well, the example would be if seven data points trended consecutively up or down on the control chart, this would mean that the system has encountered a trend or more likely it causes from tooling wear or temperature effects such as cooling or heating in the process. But the main thing here is even though you might have had an assignable cause, that in order to change all those data points is really going to come down to management. They're just not magically going to change themselves. Now, I turn here in the presentation because one of the greatest tools that I've used over the years is um, a book called Analyzing Performance Problems by uh, Magger and Pipe. Uh, one of the things, it's a very short read, and one of the things they do is they have a flow chart in this book, which really shows you when you cover a problem on a production line, or you cover a problem within a division that you might be managing, or you uncover a problem maybe at a vendor, 
there's a certain uh, flow chart that you should really follow that really gets you to the root cause of the problem. Now, one of the things that I really took from reading this book, and I've read this book at least six times, so one of the things that I really have taken from this book, as well as seen it in action, is through the years, um, I've always been um, led by various managers or even people that I reported to in management that whenever you had a problem, they said, well, are the people trained? Let's throw money at training. And if you read Mager and Pipe's book, training a lot of times is the last resort. A lot of times the problem might not even be remotely related to training. It probably lies somewhere in the system. It could be that maybe operators are allowed to do things wrong because the system puts an incentive pay system in place for them to do that. Or um, somehow um, the customer's instructions were written in properly. It had nothing to do with the operators or training in the process. So uh, they do an excellent job in this book defining when, it, when you run into a problem, how you should actually go by and look at different areas of it. I love this. This comes out of Peter Schulte's, but I'm sure everyone, or at least most people on this webinar have, have heard of the five whys, that is asking something five times. For example, Peter Schulte's gives this example. We have an oil on the warehouse floor causing safety and workman comp issues. Why do we have oil on the warehouse floor? Well, we have fork trucks that leak oil. Why do we have fork trucks that leak oil? Well, we have a bad gasket on the fork truck. Why do we have a bad gasket on the fork truck? Well, we purpose the we purchased the cheapest brand of gasket. Why do we purchase the cheapest brand of gasket? Well, why? Because purchasing's performance is done on price alone. Why is purchasing's performance done on price alone? So if you ask five why, if you ask why five times you're pretty much going to go down to the root cause of the problem or at least close to it. And for in this case, if the purchasing agent policy was based on saving the company most money based on price, not total cost, this is only going to lead us to that uh, system problem where we have to change the purchasing policy in that particular instant. Systems thinking tools. Um, there's many systems thinking tools. First is operational definitions, uh, ergonomic checks, uh, teamwork, leadership is another tool. Soft tools such as multi-voting, brainstorming, affinity, the several simple tools and the DMAIC process. Uh, design of experiments, which could cover, say, analysis of variance, ANOVA, Taguchi methods, classical designs. Process documentation, whether it's GMPs, your good manufacturing practices, and your uh, ISO guidelines. Auditing, verification, worker and supplier certification, and then data, data, and data, and metrics, especially if you're following something like the balanced scorecard approach. Now, I promised you two live examples that I would give you of systems thinking, and pretty much I'm going to tell you a story and basically what happened. Um, this is an inventory control example. Um, I was on a work team and we had approximately 19,000 SKUs in our company that we would be selling. So that's 19,000 products that we, that we could sell to our consumer base. Now, one of the problems that I found was that when looking at these uh, particular problems in inventory control, we found that that A is we really didn't get a hold on how much our inventory expenses were. And what I mean by that is some products that were in inventory were in our inventory way too long. I'm talking not even like a couple months or a couple of years. We're talking like 10 years plus. Secondly was there was a lot of uh, data errors in our in our inventory uh, we had products that we said that were on the shelf that were not on the shelf we had problems with uh, raw material that we said that we had and there was no longer the raw material there but one of the largest problems that we had was the fact that 
we were continually, continually using our uh, finished parts number as a generic number on certain items. So what that would mean is a customer would call up and he would say, I want X, Y, and Z. And we would make, say the customer wanted 10 pieces, we made 20, okay, in production. So that meant 10 pieces went to the customer, 10 pieces went on the shelf. While three days later, the customer would call for five more pieces and our salespeople would go into the computer and they would check and they'd say, well, we don't have this part. Meanwhile, we had five sitting on the shelf. So in an order of about four to six months, we completely, completely uh, intelligently assigned a proper part number and took physical inventories on some of these products. And it was just thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars that we saved on a per annum basis as a direct result of A, redefining the part number system on the SKUs, Two, fixing the data errors, finding out what inventory we had, what inventory we didn't, what inventory needed to uh, all be gathered in one lot and defined as one inventory number. Because a lot of times what we would do is we would only make half the product. And if a customer called on one and one at 15, we would just pop a couple holes in, in another side of the product. And that would actually be uh, considered a new item. And then what it really did was it prevented on the shelf product versus duplicating a product on a manufacturing order. But through this whole process, um, we had our IS department produce a lot of data for us. And um, we didn't shoot the messenger. And we fixed the problem, not the blame. And as a result, um, we not only made a lot of customers happy because we cut our lead time by in most cases, 95% on some items. Um, but also, we saved the company a lot of money as far as for uh, moving this project forward. And this was a systems thinking process where we had people from manufacturing, we had people from inventory control, we had people from shipping, from warehousing, uh, from from quality control, all over the raw material handling, all over the gamut. So when we went to fix the problem, we had a lot of people at stake helping us. The second is a warehouse example that I'd like to share with you. And the story with the warehouse example was um, we had um, enormous, enormous shipping errors. And with our shipping errors, um, we, we basically, we, we took our customer complaints and we looked at all our shipping errors that were going out, out the door and we found out one, you know, through a Pareto analysis that some areas were higher. Um, but most importantly was there was wrong items being shipped out the door. And when a wrong item gets shipped out the door, the customer gets the item and, you know, is, is not satisfactory. And, you know, in some cases you can lose a customer if they were extremely dependent on the delivery time of that order. So in analyzing our shipping problems, um, we found out a couple things. Number one is the fact that um, the ergonomics in our warehouse were, were very poor. Uh, for example, the matting that the, uh, the shippers stood on when they were packaging orders, um, you know, kind of tired them out and so forth. So we put some um, padding in that they could stand comfortably with. The lighting in the warehouse was extremely poor. And we changed over to a lot of um, LED lighting as well as lighting that was right over the workstation where the shipper packed the items and so forth. Uh, another thing that we did was we had, a, we had a lot of like inventory. So, for example, if we were on sizes uh, and our size of product was quarter inch, three eighth, half inch, three quarter, one inch, we were finding that a lot of the picking errors was that uh, a shipper would go or a picker would go up and instead of picking three quarter, they would pick one inch because that was right next to three quarter. They, they just weren't, you know, really that attuned. So what we did is we rearranged our inventory. So the fact that quarter inch was next to two inch 
two inch was next to three quarter just so the fact when the person went to the location to pick the inventory for the order um, the the item was so unlike that if they're looking at their pick sheet and it said three quarter inch they couldn't accidentally pick half inch next to three quarters so it was that helped tremendously but the most important thing that happened in this case was we brought in a local optometrist and we did an eye check of our shippers, pickers. And we found out that approximately 17% of our shippers needed eyeglasses. And, you know, you might say that this is common sense, but what it really points out is that in a lot of cases, when the human resources department hires for a particular job, there might be certain areas in that job that they completely, completely need to check for. And um, in giving this presentation to various ASQ sections, I actually had two sections that said that it really pointed out to them that they should really be checking for colorblindness because of a certain um, attribute that they have in their uh, production process that that's one of the things that they don't even check when they screen somebody in the hiring process that now that they really want to uh, really look at that and put some kind of a uh, check for color blindness uh, in that employment screening process. So uh, just by checking people's eyes and then we move forward as far as if somebody is to apply for a job for this, they have to be, you know, make sure that they, you know, have eyeglasses or at least be checked for their visual acuity. So that was a major thing. As, as a result of doing all the systems thinking work in this area, we, we, we brought in some people for maintenance because of the lighting and ergonomical issues. Uh, we brought some people in from sales who were taking the orders. Uh, we brought our shipping people in, our picking people in, uh, some fork, forklift drivers in. We had a very good, well-rounded uh, work team that worked on this process, and we cut our customer complaints like 80 percent by putting all those things in not to mention the uh monetary uh savings that we had on you know sh you know think of it one shipping error you ship something wrong typically the vendor now is responsible for the freight and then you're not only responsible for the freight you got to handle the, the item when it comes back you got to process the paperwork you got to send a debit and then you got to send a credit and vice versa. So, you know, so, you know, one customer complaint on a shipping error, um, you know, might end up costing, you know, a couple thousand dollars per se. So, so just by saving the co the company so many complaints um, really just extended the overall um, system that we had of uh, shipping. Systems thinking, look beyond the obvious. Don't let the system run your people. Help your people control the system. And how, how is systems thinking used in your job, your church, your sports, your company? Are we part of the problem or part of the solution? So at this time, we, we, we have, we have uh, about 10 minutes or so. Uh, I would like to uh, take questions. Uh, Norval, if you want to take this over as far as the chat box, if we have one. Sure. <clears throat> Thanks, John. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look here. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. At the moment, it doesn't look like we have any questions. If you do have questions, there is a chat box. I know this is a little different from what we're used to uh, as far as uh, an online meeting platform. Uh, well, yesterday, uh, we switched out uh, from WebEx to any meeting. Uh, primarily because WebEx uh, wanted us to upgrade our plan because they told us our plan was no longer uh, going to be supported. And uh, what they didn't tell us, though, was the fact that our costs were going to increase significantly. So uh, yesterday we quickly found another uh, online uh, meeting platform. Uh, John, it doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment. Okay. Oh, yes, we do. We do have a question that just came uh, from Thomas Miller. Uh, other than the fifth discipline and thinking, 
and Systems by D. Meadows, what other books or resources would you suggest? Um, okay. What, okay. Uh, do I just speak verbally, I guess, Nora? Or you want me to type this sure. in, or how do you? Sure, go, go What's ahead. That? Uh, sure, go ahead and, and answer verbally. I'm, I'm sure that would be okay. 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 Um, one of, one of the uh, best books that I've ever seen on systems thinking is The Leader's Handbook. It's called The Leader's Handbook. And it's, its subtitle is called A Guide to Inspiring Your People and Managing the Daily Workflow. And it's by Peter Schultes. And if you, you get, it's by McGraw Hill, so is the uh, publisher. So if you went on Amazon or something like that, you could get it. Um, I always have the reference of uh, Dr. Deming's Out of the Crisis. And then um, if, if you haven't read Analyzing Performance Problems by Megger and Pipe, Megger's M A G E R and pipe p-i-p-e um it's they have a flow chart in there that is awesome that i've used for years for looking at different situations and problems because a lot of times um we think that training is automatically the the solution to everything and if you read Manger's book they really outline that training is probably your last resort that you should use for solving a system problem Okay, uh, the next question uh, that we have here is organizations are vertically organized, uh, but value stream owners need to work with multiple executive members. Any tips and tricks? Um, the, the only tips or tricks I would say is, well, two, two, two areas I would say. Number one is um, I, I kind of stress this in, in the presentation, and if you haven't taken the self-assessment test of emotional intelligence or strength finders or standout to really know where you stand in the process, because I know a lot of times over the years, especially with dealing with different layers of management and so forth, um, there might be a certain area that I'm extremely weak in. And if I don't see that hidden blind spot, I'm always going to have problems with any kind of management team I'm with. But the second thing that I have to stress is manage, management deals in numbers. And the more I can speak their language, whether, um, you know, ask, ask somebody to give you some help in your finance or your accounting department and say, listen, how can I present this? You know, can, can, can we get cost on how much this this defect stuff is is hurting us that I can go to management and say, you know what, this is costing us three hundred thousand dollars last year. You know, this is an issue. We need to, like, address this. I think if you speak their 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 monetary terms, I think you're going to grab their attention. Okay, uh, moving right along. Uh, we've had a few questions from folks here too about whether or not if the webinar was recorded today, and I can say yes, it was. Um, we did uh, manage to do that. Uh, we will upload that to our YouTube channel here uh, a little bit later today. Uh, John, we also have uh, some requests from folks if they could get copies of your slide deck. Yeah, that's that, that's fine. Absolutely. Uh, do you want to handle that, or do you want them to go directly to myself? Uh, it might be more efficient if if you send it to me and then I share. You just it put with a them. link. Yeah, uh, because okay. we will follow up. Well, actually, actually okay. go ahead. I, no, I was going to say, Norma. I believe I sent this to you a week ago, so this is the one that you have. Okay. Good. Then we'll, we'll I'll share it with them uh, in our uh, follow up. Uh, okay. We'll ask for yeah, that's that, that's fine. Okay, yeah, we'll ask for feedback, and we'll also send a uh, uh, a link to where the 
uh, webinar recording is posted as well. So uh, that'll be forthcoming. Uh, the next question we have here, um, the International Council of Systems Engineering, INCOSE, uh, gives, a differ gives different definitions than you showed. Did you also refer to INCOSE for systems thinking? And if not, why? I, I, well, let, 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 me, let me say this much. Uh, to answer their questions, no, I did not. I did not reference it. And it was basically on my experience and my experience with work groups, as well as my experience on uh, presenting in this area, and I, I, I didn't do it. I mean, that's that's my answer. Okay. Uh, moving onward here, sometimes senior management, excuse me, sometimes senior managers equate the term systems thinking with just observing the organization at a higher level. It's a continual education effort to help them understand that it's more than that. What would be your elevator speech? What would your elevator speech on systems thinking be? Um, hmm. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a good one. Um, I, I would, I would say here here's what my now this is just off the cuff so it's not going to be perfect here but um uh, my elevator would be uh hi my name's john lafferty and um i've noticed since i've been with you for a while that you've been complaining or you've been telling me stories about this area and it's really been a headache for you and so forth did you ever realize that maybe it's not your problem that maybe just something's happening there do you mind if we take a look at it? Sure, why not, John? Let's take a look at it, okay? And we take a look at it, and I say something like, well, based on what I see here, it doesn't really seem like the people that are working for you have really um, any part on changing this. It looks like it's a bigger problem that we gotta look at various aspects of why this is happening. Let's dig further with the data and see what it shows us and then take it from there. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, any recommendation on how to choose a competent consulting service or avoid a non-competent company? Wait a minute, you, you broke up when you said that to me. What was the first part of the question? Oh, sorry, uh, well, I'll repeat it. It's uh, any recommendation sure. on how to choose a competent consulting service or avoid a non-competent company? Um, yeah. it, it, it sounds a little vague with the question, but I'll, I'll, I'll answer it the best I can. I would say... I, I mean, either through a reference check or, um, you know, t talk to some of the people that work there. Um, I don't I don't know how how else you would actually do that. I mean, you can find out, you know, maybe complaints that they had on a company or something like that. If you're looking at to see, you know, how well the company is or, you know, where it ranks and all this other stuff. But I, I find the best way is to, you know, even if you got to stop off at a local establishment after work and hear some of the people that work there and talk about it. Uh, usually if the, you know, if you, if you're hearing trouble at different lower levels of the company, it's probably a company you don't want to work for. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Let me roll back here. We still have a few more minutes till we hit the top of the hour. Sure. Um, I have a very lengthy question here regarding anymeeting.com, and I'll touch on it one more time here. Uh, we did have to switch from WebEx uh, because we were notified by WebEx that we needed to upgrade our plan. Uh, and as far as uh, upgrade for them was concerned, uh, they wanted to uh, 
bump us up to another level for which we really did not need uh, so much capacity, and it would have made uh, costs for being able to continue offering webinars uh, cost prohibitive. So we ended up needing to switch. We knew we couldn't switch back to go to meeting.com because uh, it only gave us 100 uh, slots for folks to call in. Uh, any meeting was really uh, the only economical choice. There were a couple of others that we looked at uh, kind of on the fly, uh, and this was the one we came up with. I know that there are a few uh, ASQ divisions that are also using anymeeting.com and seem to like it. Uh, this was our first experience with it today, and going forward, this is what we're going to be using because uh, we did sign up for an annual plan. Uh, so for the next 12 months, uh, this is going to be it. So uh, hopefully uh, this doesn't create a lot of hassle for too many folks. I know uh, GoToMeeting and WebEx were relatively easy to use. Uh, from what I can see here, uh, the buttons that we need to use to operate this uh, are in different spots. And there's a little bit of a learning curve, I know, uh, not just for me, but also I'm sure for uh, folks who aren't familiar with this particular uh, online meeting platform. But um, sorry about the last minute change, but it was just something that needed to be done, unfortunately. Uh, John, I'm looking to see if there's any other questions that doesn't appear to be. I'm going to grab the screen back okay. in just a second. Sure. And I want to yeah, show no folks one thing here. Let's see if I can get to it. Okay, I wanted to let folks know that our next webinar will be coming up on Tuesday, uh, the 14th. It's Fix Your Fights, um, Using Better Conflict Management Skills. Uh, that will be with Angela Spranger. Uh, this particular presenter uh, was scheduled to speak on this topic back in February, but due to a uh, sudden death in her family on the morning that uh, the webinar was scheduled, we of course needed to reschedule it, and this was uh, the next time that she had available. So I know a lot of people have registered for this one, and we still have spaces for folks if they are interested in registering for this one. I know there has been uh, quite a considerable amount of requests for it, so uh, we're happy to be able to share it with you. Uh, let me zoom back here real quick and see if there's anything else. Um, got a few, few points of feedback from folks saying that uh, there were a couple times where uh, the audio was cut off uh, during your talk, John, but then there was a few others who were saying that they said it was very easy to use and no issues. So a uh, little bit of a mixed bag here, I think. Uh, but I think uh, mm -hmm. once we get used to things again, uh, it'll become uh, second nature, I'm sure, for a lot of folks. But anyway, it looks like we don't have any other questions coming through. Uh, we are a little bit over time here. I'd uh, like to thank everyone uh, for their patience today. I know we got off to a little bit of a rocky start, uh, but next week uh, we'll do our best to improve as we typically have. Um, I'd like to thank John uh, for presenting for us today. You're welcome. And uh, we look forward to seeing many of you again uh, next week. So. Until next week on Tuesday at uh, 12 noon uh, Eastern Time, uh, this is Norval Johnston, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks again. Bye now. Thank you.